uh, note. Uh, Matt Roth uh, at the uh, the associate director of the Andrea Mitchell Center for all the work he's done uh, to make this conference a reality. With that said, let's turn now to our first panel, Judicial Decision-Making in American Constitutional Development. And we have three distinguished speakers who will each speak for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then we'll open it up to you, the audience, to ask questions, make comments. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, raise your hand and then you'll be called on. In order to keep things orderly, uh, everyone's on force mute. And so you have to raise your hand, then we'll unmute you, and then you can unmute yourself. But the people who are not muted are our three um, panelists, uh, and we're very lucky to have with us Mark Graber, who in addition to many accomplishments has told me that he is Roger's very first graduate student. So it's nice to have him as the very first speaker at Roger's retirement conference. In the time since studying with Rogers, Mark has gone on to become one of the most visible scholars of American constitutional law and politics. He's the Regents Professor at the University of Maryland and the author of approximately 200 articles and chapters along with numerous books, including the 2008 work, Dred Scott and the Problem of Constitutional Evil and the 2013 book, A New Introduction to American Constitutionalism. It's nice to welcome Mark back to Penn where he taught here in the fall. We also have with us Julie Nokov, who is interim dean of the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Politics at the University at Albany SUNY, where she's also professor of political science and women's gender and sexuality studies. She's an acclaimed scholar of US political development, whose work among other topics has explored the mutual impact of law and the categories of identity her book, Racial Union, was given the 2009 Ralph Bunchy Award. Among her huge volume of other works are three additional books, The Supreme Court and the Presidency, Constituting Workers Protecting Women, and the recently released American by Birth, Wong Kim Ark and the Battle for Citizenship. And to um, be our, our final and third uh, panelist today will be Keith Whittington, who's the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics at Princeton, along with Mark Graber, um, Keith has authored a multi-volume casebook on American constitutionalism. He's the author of a dizzying number of books and articles on such topics as academic free speech, judicial review, the politics of impeachment, among many other topics. His 2019 book, Repugnant Laws, Judicial Review of Acts of Congress from the Founding to the Present, was the Thomas M. Cooley Book Prize Award winner. So thank you all for being here. I'll turn things over to you, Mark. Thank you very, very much for having us. I should first emphasize something Professor Green said. Although Rogers looks 15 to 20 years younger than most of us, this is a celebration of Rogers retirement, not his celebrating our retirements. Just to get that clear. Now, this is a strange session on the judiciary would not be strange if we were to be part of a celebration for Rogers receiving tenure or even better yet being promoted. Because like a great many people in the field, Rogers early work were fairly traditional works on the jurisprudential side of public law. So the liberalism book, study the way liberal principles played out in judicial opinions. One of Rogers' first articles was claiming the Warren court was about autonomy, not just equality. And indeed, it was not published in a political science journal, but in the Texas Law Review. And a number of Rogers students went on and started to develop what has become known, fortunately or unfortunately, as regime theory in public law. And I think Keith is a prominent player in that. Julie is a prominent player in that. Some people I see on the screen are prominent players in that. But Rogers actually isn't a prominent player in regime theory that shortly after he gave birth to a number of us, Rogers largely veered away from the judiciary, veered away 
from public law and went on to related projects but not really public law projects. And one of the ways of summarizing is when we go to APSA. Keith, Julie and I and some others there show up at the public law meetings. Rogers doesn't come as often. He's in the political history or political or other meetings. But I want to suggest that it's not an accident that regime theory is largely a product of Roger Smith students that there is a deep Rogers influence in regime theory. And to understand this, we need to look at the problems of public law when Rogers firmly identified himself as a public law scholar. There was something called political jurisprudence but as Martin Shapiro pointed out, there were people who did the political and people who did the jurisprudence, but nobody did the political jurisprudence. Moreover, while people who did the political were political scientists, people who did the jurisprudence were accused of being little law professors really having not much place in the profession. Now on the political side, the dominant model was the attitudinal model. And this is an absolute stroke of brilliance. I probably will have to repeat this for everyone to grasp the brilliance. What the attitudinal model discovered is that in circumstances where law doesn't matter, law doesn't matter. This would earn at least two people a lifetime achievement award for this insight. The idea is you study a court where you agree that any case that gets the Supreme Court of the United States gets there because there are legitimate differences over the law. You then discover that agreements over law don't explain what the court did. And it was the challenge of Rogers and his generation to try to say something more profound than that. In particular, could you say things that were recognized as political science and not simply law professor, but actually, and here be seriously, were far more interesting than when law doesn't matter, law doesn't matter. And the crucial essay in this, one that I confess I did not fully appreciate when it came out, is on the essay on the new institutionalism and the future of public law, where Rogers started by saying one of the features of institutions is institutions matter. The way politics is organized matters. And as Rogers would later phrase it, politics matters. And Rogers then went on and said, and political ideas matter. And one of the things those people who were doing jurisprudence can do is explore not simply the structure of political ideas, that is not simply come up with defenses of liberalism, but to explore, does liberalism matter in politics? Does it matter if one has these set of sort of semi-abstract principles and a polity is organized on these abstract principles rather than say, at first then republicanism? such that a polity organized on republicanism will actually be different because the ideas matter. And it's political jurisprudence because we're not simply interested in finding out whether ideas matter, but once we know 
that ideas matter, we can then bring that back into our jurisprudence. If this is what liberalism does in practice, perhaps we ought to modify liberalism in these ways. Even if we are Republican thinkers, if it turns out liberalism in practice gets more Republican ideals than Republicanism in practice, or Republicanism is more likely to pervert it than liberalism, we ought to be liberals. And so in this way, the new institutionalism promise to actually create a genuine political jurisprudence. Now, one interesting problem with the piece is the piece was at the end called the future of public law, but there actually wasn't much public law in the piece. Most of it was devoted to the new institutionalism and how we could apply it to public law, but you could also of course, apply it to comparative politics, American government, the sociology of the British parliament, whatever. And it turned out, if you were studying, as Rogers, I think, was fundamentally interested in the history of ideas, you soon learn that lots of people had ideas outside of the court that they often express those ideas better outside of the court than inside of the court, that the court at times were simply reflecting ideas outside of the court. So you can see Rogers' work drifting to outside of the court. The book on cynicism talks about courts, but there are lots of things going on outside of the court. And we then get the politics of creating people which is about ideas, a very crucial element is people are constituted by ideas, not simply by needs, but it's largely outside of the courts. And so Keith and myself, Doug Reed, a few others, Julie, Julie by sort of adoption, found ourselves slightly orphaned as our advisor moved into other areas while we're staying around. But then we came up with an idea. Rogers was primarily interested in questions of how should the Constitution be interpreted? So one of the points of liberalism in American constitutional law was here was a liberal theory of interpreting the Constitution. Now, the judicial role in interpreting the Constitution was certainly part of the analysis, but I'll argue that in Rogers' early work, the constitutional interpretation questions play more of a role than the function of the judiciary. But it turned out you could ask all the new institutionalist questions with respect to the judicial function. And what you discovered is the way in which the judicial the judiciary function was not the way it functioned in legal theory. That legal theory at this time was dominated by the counter majoritarian question, and the court wasn't a counter majoritarian institution. Number said it was a non majoritarian institution. In one of Keith's works, it was an institution that tended to buttress presidential power, and whether you thought that was majoritarian or not depended on what you thought of the presidency. Is the presidency fundamentally an anti-majoritarian organization? It's really one person, or is it the most majoritarian organization institution in American politics? This is the only one that has a national vote. Even if that national vote is mediated by the Electoral College, you could then ask yourself, what do courts do? And you discovered not that courts simply aided the dominant majority, as Robert Dahl has written in some neo Dahlians did, but that courts tended because of their distinctive institutional function, something we all got from Rogers, courts tended to aid some people in their political struggles than others. And if you want an interesting example of this, 
the way the Senate Republican Committee is reacting to the leak of the Alito opinion. It is not with great joy. It is, we didn't want this. We'd much rather have the Roberts keep cutting it down. So some elements of the Republican Party are reacting with great joy. Others aren't, and we took it, okay, let's map who really benefits and then ask ourselves, given who really benefits in politics from judicial review, the Jerry Rosenberg question, what does the court actually do? Does the court simply stall reformers? Does it make some types of reform more difficult and some types of reform more easy? Once we have those questions, now we can go back to arguing the normative questions. So what we see in Roger's work and in the work he inspired is something Professor Green talked about, a breakdown of the law politics distinction that we either study law or we study politics. Rogers was one of the first to realize that the court work with ideas that were developed outside the court and then the ideas the court developed go back into society. If you doubt that think of diversity, which was not very central to civil rights until Bakke. Court took an idea that was advanced by Harvard, gave it prominence, went back. You learn that it's not the case that when we write American government textbooks, we should have a chapter on courts and then a big thing called everything else. Rather, courts are distinctive, but so is the Agricultural Bureau. So is all forms of politics, and they all interact. And that Rogers taught all of us, those of us who largely stayed in public law, and those of us like Rogers who wandered around the world to share his insights of what a fuller political science would look like with numerous generations of students and perhaps more important, numerous people outside the academy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, always a tough act to follow, uh, but I'll make my best attempt here. In 1988, when I was a junior in college, Roger Smith published an article entitled Political Jurisprudence, the New Institutionalism and the Future of Public Law in the American Political Science Review. That essay took aim at the narrow scope of public law research that was then dominant in the discipline and what he perceived as the framing of the entire terrain as merely an unfruitful debate between advocates for behavioralist and normative analysis. Surely, he argued, there had to be more to it than this, and he identified emerging interest in institutionalism as one possible path forward into what this more might constitute. He noted that qualitative inquiries into norms, values, and ideologies could generate descriptive studies grounded in careful empirical analysis that nonetheless has normative significance. At the heart of new institutionalism, as he described it, was the insistence, quote, that analyses of politics should explore how relatively enduring structures of human conduct have shaped the existing array of resources, rules, and values instead of simply taking that array as given. Both in terms of the expansiveness of how to study public law and the reorientation of what factors might matter, this path-breaking publication has rightfully earned its place in the canon of public law scholarship. With this reconfiguration of what our lenses must capture and how we should understand causes and outcomes, we move beyond models and into understanding. With this understanding, we can then move to deeper normative argument that takes historical ideological structures into account. This is not precisely Nietzsche's writing a history of the present, nor is it an attempt to locate a usable past, 
but rather an understanding that the interplay between ideas and institutional structure matter, not only in shaping the path of constitutional development, but also in establishing the outer boundaries of what is possible within the contemporary landscape. These insights dovetail nicely with Rogers thinking about political science as a discipline, a topic to which he's returned over his career. His 1997 essay on the tension between political science's mission to serve American democracy and to be a true science was a harbinger of the perestroika movement that would sweep political science in 2000, leading to an era of reform across the discipline and within the American Political Science Association itself. The effects of this movement in which Rogers played a key role still resonate today as we survey a discipline that now has organized sections on qualitative and multi-method research and civic engagement. In this essay, he called for political science to redefine its fundamental task to be, quote, to explore in the most rigorous ways all topics that are arguably politically fundamental with special attention to those that are predictably neglected for both intellectual and political reasons by governmental and private sector analysts, politicians, and the media. While Rogers had entered the discipline as political theorist, his generative curiosity, both about what makes American politics tick and about this legacy of structural discrimination of a variety of types, pushed him toward mid-level theory that rests upon dense, rich empirical analysis of these phenomena. In this regard, his work serves as a model for holding many priorities simultaneously. The need for empirically rich research that draws from a variety of sources and approaches, the need to maintain focus on what the tools of political science can do to explain politics from both elite and non-elite standpoints, the need to see the normative implications of our work, and the need to attend to the discipline itself and how its choices of what to valorize ultimately affect what political science can do and what it means both within and outside of the academy. These interventions made space for a new growth of work in both American politics and in the law and courts field. This work itself ranges far beyond Rogers' own interests, and indeed some of it transforms and even challenges his own insights. Nonetheless, much of this body of work carries the mark of these early insights. Many public law scholars now consider the importance of legal institutions in their relationship with ideas. They develop projects that employ broad empirical research strategies that can capture the shape of institutions, the influence of ideas, and the role of power. Both in their choices of topics to explore and in their analysis of the implications of their work, they embrace the normative impact that this scholarship can have. And many such scholars have taken their work into the public sphere, showing how grounded political science scholarship can and should play an important role in addressing political problems in the world today. I'll discuss a few substantive areas of research that I understand to reflect these commitments, looking particularly at work in constitutional law and public law that has centered subordinated groups. For each area, placing constitutional subordination at the center of the analysis helps us to understand better how structuring, managing, implementing, and in some cases dismantling subordination under law has shaped these groups' history and current standing. It also reveals how the constitutional management of subordinated identity shaped constitutional history and constitutional development. In all of this, we can return to the long debate about liberalism in American politics. These insights can help us gain some clarity about the role of identity in our understanding of the Constitution and its significance in our current political moment. Some commentators dismiss these struggles as mere culture wars that distract from more important structural issues about the scope of national regulatory authority, the increasing concentration of wealth and power among a few, or the legitimacy and security of the national state. These lines of research, however, illustrate the extent to which these issues are deeply interwoven with constitutionalism and its failings. If Susan Burgess, your, initial, your original commentator, were here, she would likely have spoken about the extraordinary growth of work addressing sexuality, constitutionalism, and political development. Her own contributions have been valuable for their insightfulness 
and for their capacity to expand the scope of constitutional analysis to include pop culture. Her 2009 book, The Founding Fathers, Pop Culture and Constitutional Law, brilliantly destabilizes original intent and conventional constitutional interpretation by turning to clear theory. She uses irony and parody to destabilize key precedents and thinkers, pressing for an anti-foundational but liberating understanding of constitutional rights. Her call for new narratives, which I read as hopeful in 2009, is now an urgent demand to reshape constitutional politics in perilous times. Stephen Engel and Timothy Lyle, while not writing in an American political development framework, nonetheless take up the challenge to consider the role of ideas in legal institutions in their work. Their book, Disrupting Dignity, explains the ambivalent relationship between dignity and gay rights, unveiling dignity's capacity to limit, separate, and divide queer communities, despite its adoption as a foundation for modern LGBTQ equality. Working in fields of law and culture, they seek to reformulate dignity to achieve a more radically inclusive future. Research on the family and its legal and constitutional significance also falls within this range. Several chapters in a volume that Carol Nathanoff and I recently edited, entitled Stating the Family, illustrate just a few of the directions that such work, work can go. Tamara Metz reads the Obergefell decision closely, linking the politics of same-sex marriage to a neoliberal politics of care. Ellen Anderson illustrates how activists pressing for same-sex marriage understood their relationship to the state and how this influenced their act. Gwendolyn Alfonso, who's also published a book about family and American political development, and Richard Bensel illustrate how antebellum Louisiana concerns about race, motherhood, and paternity shaped the complex terrain of property ownership and inheritance in integration unions. Allison Gash and Priscilla Yeaman, who are working on a larger project along these lines, illustrate how the long-term development of conservative, gendered, and sexualized norms about families collided directly with the desire to restrict immigration, generating legal and policy outcomes that encouraged deportation and family disunity during the Trump administration. And of course, Priscilla's independent work on marriage illustrates how struggles over marriage have defined aspects of the American state and at times have driven political development. This bit scratches the surface of a variety of work that has taken root in recent years. This work presses us to consider sexuality and familial relations as serious subjects of inquiry, because legal controversies over their regulation have contributed to political and constitutional development. We see this across a whole range of substantive policy areas and across constitutional time. Rogers himself has written extensively on the problem of race in American political and constitutional development. While later scholars, including myself, have not always agreed with either his approach or his conclusions, the existence of debate over how race works in American constitutionalism and its long-term structural impact is, to my mind, welcome and healthy. For too long, serious consideration of slavery and its impact on constitutional law and development were largely absent from political science. More broadly, the study of race in American politics was a distinctive inquiry that did not, for the most part, concern the broader discipline. Now, even beyond our concerns with constitutional development, we see historically inclined considerations of race in party building, in the development of the American welfare state, in labor politics, in the shape of American foreign policy, in evaluating the legacy of slavery, and in so many other areas. I am, of course, a beneficiary of this intellectual space. Racial Union explores how the regulation of interracial intimacy in Alabama between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement reflected state-level constitutional development. As white supremacy expanded politically and culturally, banning miscegenation became an important part of defining and maintaining its legitimacy. Populist and conservative competitors for state power grappled with how to regulate it properly resulting in a legal apparatus that could occasionally exonerate an obviously guilty defendant to uphold the twisted logic of a democratically legitimate white state. 
With the shape of the state defined and increasingly subject to external attack, its advocates became less willing to explore the contours of this fundamental or of this foundational constitutional logic, shutting down some appeals quickly. More recently, Carol Nakanoff and I have explored the history of birthright citizenship in the United States and its constitutional codification in Wong Kim Ark versus the United States. The story of this landmark ruling is steeped in the cultural and political history of Chinese immigration and its restriction. Long-standing common law principle collided with xenophobic resistance to increased Asian presence in the United States. Restrictionism, in addition to grounding this constitutional conflict and its root, shaped the rise of the administrative state as American courts provided fairly wide latitude for administrative decision-making in the context of entry disputes. At the same time, a highly organized and well-funded campaign pushed back against exclusion, incidentally supporting Wang Kim Ark's bid to re-enter the United States as a citizen and open the ports to all others similarly situated. I could discuss many more contributors to this project, some of whom are around in Zoom room. My work has benefited tremendously from engagement with Pamela Brandwine, who has focused particularly on the importance of ideas and their transformation in constitutional thought. Her writing on the state action doctrine and the shifting meaning of the 14th Amendment is particularly salient today. Kimberly Johnson's work on Jim Crow reform, while not explicitly addressing constitutional development, illustrates how white reformers could understand their political order as a flexible and improvable constitutional structure that could be rendered legitimate through engagement with both Black reformers and the polit ruling political elite. And of course, my friend Mark Graver has likewise grappled with these issues for many years. Through all of this, political science has in some ways produced its own 1619 project. Indeed, I had the honor of co-editing a volume published way back in 2008 entitled Race and American Political Development that could be understood that way. Maybe we should have been better about branding and marketing. But having the space within political science to do this work, to understand and evaluate the structural role of race in American politics is so important for understanding both how American political development and the political space in which we now find ourselves operating. So what have we learned through the availability of the space that can inform politics now? Number one, constitutional liberalism readily accommodates and incorporates hierarchy. What we understand is a legitimate constitutional order has historically not just allowed, but rather has depended upon an understanding of both citizenship and belonging with gradations. While constitutional development has at times shifted these distinctions away from hard legally enforced status distinctions, we have never had consensus on as a nation about universal and equal civic membership. One can argue about whether this reflects the persistence of multiple traditions alongside liberalism in American constitutionalism, or if it is internal to liberalism itself, but the bottom line is that these hierarchies cannot be understood as anything less and a structural feature of American constitutionalism. Number two, our constitutional structure's maintenance depends on the functional leadership of at least some elites who are committed to maintaining the constitutional project itself, with the constitutional project not necessarily having a strong normative valence. Without this elite support, which the framers had hoped to bake in structurally, the constitution itself provides few guardrails to protect the framers' vision of representative democracy. Number three, we continue and must continue to debate the best ways to dismantle these hierarchies. To oversimplify drastically, we can trace through American history a long tradition of what I will call leveraging the idealized liberal civic member to advance group rights. The Black, Asian, and Filipino members of the Army and Navy in the 19th and early 20th centuries who sought to claim rights and citizenship on the basis of their service illustrate this strategy. Out trans, lesbian, and gay service members employed the same rhetoric 
to defeat Don't Ask, Don't Tell. The NAACP carefully selected its higher education plaintiffs along these lines as men and women seeking to uplift themselves and their race. The lead plaintiffs in the battle for same-sex marriage likewise presented themselves as ordinary American families, but for one insignificant difference. And even now, Twitter is awash with abortion stories about what I will call the tragically necessary abortion. But alongside this path, we can trace the more radical path that has not claimed rights on the basis of the claimer's similarity to other rights bearers on every ground but one. It should be noted that this tradition of contentious resistance cannot always, as the previously described tradition does, fit within a liberal framework of rationalized engagement and advocacy for democratic incorporation. From John Brown to ACT UP to today's raucous protests against Alito's leaked anti-abortion Supreme Court opinion, Americans and those who would reclaim and redefine America have challenged the state directly and demanded structural change that would remake it. This too is part of American politics and may be increasingly necessary as the space for liberal engagement over values seems to shrink. All of this should leave us both uncertain and more than a little anxious about what comes next. You may reach for your Xanax prescription now. Unlike some of our Americanist colleagues, we cannot run a model to produce predictive results, and I wouldn't want us to attempt it. But we can see why the conjunction of polarization, the capture of one political party by an anti-liberal faction that demands the reimposition of legal and status-based hierarchies, and the drastically increased warping of our model for democratic representation spell a lot of trouble. I'm glad that we have this intellectual space to take these issues seriously and understand their roots. I won't be bold enough to claim that these insights constitute a legacy for Rogers. He likely disagrees with both some of my analysis and my evaluation of what we have learned. But I'm grateful for the engagement and for the conversation, which will continue. Indeed, it must continue if we are to survive as a nation. Thank you to everyone who has taken up Rogers' call to build, quote, a democratic scientific political science by critically examining American constitutional development. Thanks. So thanks, uh, Julie. Um, so I took uh, my marching orders to be uh, to say something substantive about digital says making American constitutional development while um, saying um, uh, that I'm really glad that Rogers is finally retiring. Um, uh, so uh, I have uh, some pretty slides to show in part, so I stick to my marching orders. Um, I did write an essay a couple of years ago um, associated with Rogers service um, as president um, of APSA. Um, in about his uh, work and its uh, legacy uh, more generally. Uh, that was in PS. Um, uh, urge you to go look at it. Um, uh, it's a good opportunity for me um, to uh, take a look at his uh, broader work and try to think about it um, in context, um, which was always a nice uh, thing to uh, do. And of course, um, as others already noted, um, there's a lot of stuff there and it uh, covers a wide range um, of materials. Um, and interestingly, his connections to thinking about judicial decision making in American constitutional development specifically um, was very early uh, in his career. Um, that's uh, when I uh, encountered him um, at Yale. And I have to admit that I sort of backed into this uh, particular topic um, by accident. Uh, when I uh, came to Yale, I certainly uh, did not intend uh, to do anything uh, relating uh, judicial decision making. I had no real interest in courts um, as such, uh, didn't have much interest in American politics um, as a field of study, um, in part um, because of Rogers um, and Steve Skronik, um, who's on this call as well. Um, uh, I actually decided, well, what, what do you know? There's actually something interesting uh, in the field of American politics um, that uh, might actually be worth uh, my attention um, a little bit. Um, and eventually I came around to actually believing there was something um, in judicial uh, decision-making in particular. Um, and that aspect was particularly uh, this guy's fault. Um, uh, then part uh, when I was in graduate school, um, he was working particularly on the civic ideals book, 
um, uh, which uh, was both a very intriguing model about trying to do um, a huge synthetic, uh, large in qualitative um, a study. He made it look easy. Um, it's not easy. And so in part, I want to talk about sort of how I screwed it up uh, while trying to uh, follow his example, although I did learn one important lesson from him, which is not to promise um, a second volume um, unless you actually already have one. Um, uh, so maybe eventually we'll see a follow-up to uh, civic ideals. Um, I hear uh, that's in the works and that would be um, a, a terrific um, addition. Um, but Rogers um, not only sort of highlighted in doing that work in civic ideals and in the political jurisprudence um, article that Mark mentioned, the uh, uh, value of thinking about courts and their relevance uh, to thinking about American politics and how it has uh, developed um, over time more generally. Um, but Raj is also a real model for me in thinking about how to integrate um, the study of ideas into uh, the study of empirical uh, political institutions um, as well. And it's through that kind of example um, that I started taking American politics more seriously um, as a field of study and something that um, I might be able to contribute to. Um, uh, courts are a particularly interesting uh, point of contact uh, between uh, discussion of ideas um, and um, actual policymaking um, and political activity. They're not the only way um, of building those bridges, but courts is sort of an interesting um, way, and I think a particularly easy way of building those uh, bridges. And so for me, um, it was sort of part of my entry point of thinking about um, uh, maybe as somebody who is primarily interested in American political thought and political theory uh, when I first got to graduate school, um, uh, as a way of thinking about um, how ideas uh, play themselves out in American politics and why that actually might be uh, worth studying uh, some more. Um, so uh, my recent effort at trying to do some of that is in this book, uh, Repugnant Laws, um, uh, which was uh, long in the making in part because Mark distracted me uh, with um, a case book. Um, but uh, Repugnant Laws tries to do something somewhat similar to what Civic Ideals did in the sense that um, it tries to uh, sweep across a broad um, uh, compass of American uh, history um, uh, while taking into account a tremendous number um, of, of cases um, and judicial decisions and trying to think about what larger patterns emerge out of it. Uh, the themes are different, uh, certainly, uh, than Civic Ideals, but I think they're themes that resonate uh, some with Rogers' more general concerns um, relating to American political development, more generally of trying to think about how do courts fit into the larger political system? How do they contribute to that larger political regime and the kinds of political projects um, that are being advanced um, through that regime? What kinds of values um, and, and commitments um, uh, do courts and judicial decisions uh, reflect? And so the Republican Laws book in particular um, is concerned with how the US Supreme Court has reviewed acts of Congress um, across uh, the scope of American history. Um, and it takes as a starting point some other uh, Yaleys, um, uh, notably uh, Robert Dahl, who I did not have much contact with when I uh, was um, at Yale, um, but did uh, was forced to read some of his uh, stuff, because um, uh, that's what you did um, at Yale at the time, um, and Mark Graber. Um, who um, uh, reached out to me uh, soon after um, I graduated and said, hey, I heard you were a former Rogers student. You probably need more guidance than you got at Yale. So uh, let me give you some bad advice of my own uh, that you can add up with the bad advice that Rogers gave you. Um, and so uh, he has uh, led me astray ever since. Um, uh, but Mark also um, was quite significant, I think, in trying to modify and put in context some of Dahl's uh, work, a little bit of Dahl's work that he did on courts and try to think about and help me think about um, how um, uh, we should think about courts within a larger um, uh, political uh, context. And Pregnant Laws tries to build um, on that particular legacy. It also has a, sort of a Princeton connection um, as well. So this is Edward uh, Corwin back when he was in court packing mode. Um, and um, uh, Corwin um, uh, plays a significant role in this story as well because Corwin was the first guy to come up with a canonical list of cases, an inventory of instances in which the court has struck down um, acts of Congress um, as being um, unconstitutional. Um, but Mark um, suggested to me that his list was probably uh, wrong, um, or at least incomplete, um, uh, which uh, put me off on a wild goose chase trying to figure out um, to what degree that was true um, and made me do a lot more work for this book than I uh, was originally intending. So the list that Corwin eventually de originally developed um, uh, 
uh, in the early part of the 20th century um, has subsequently been maintained by the Congressional Research Service um, in which they continue to update um, cases um, in which the court has uh, struck down federal laws as unconstitutional. There's likewise a list the court also developed initially um, of cases in which the court um, strikes down state laws um, as unconstitutional. Um, part of what I wound up doing for this repugnant laws um, project though was um, uh, questioning whether or not the Corwin list was really adequate. Um, to understanding um, how the court had exercised the power of judicial review um, across American history uh, relative to acts of Congress, in particular, and what kinds of constitutional limitations um, the court had actually enforced um, against uh, congressional power um, over uh, time. And I was persuaded by Mark um, uh, that uh, Corwin's list probably understates uh, what the court um, was up to. And so as a consequence, um, uh, one thing that, that made uh, Republican laws take so long to produce was I wound up having to go back and read a lot of cases trying to figure out um, a more comprehensive inventory um, of uh, cases in which the court had uh, reviewed acts of Congress. And that's now um, available if anyone else uh, wants to make use of it. It's on my website, the Judicial Review of Congress database. Um, and this uh, slide reflects sort of the gray line is the uh, Corwin list, the Congressional Research Service list of cases in which the court had struck down acts of Congress as unconstitutional. Uh, the orange line um, is mine. Um, in which I think there are a lot more cases uh, than the initial uh, list indicated um, uh, in which the court had enforced constitutional limits um, against um, uh, Congress. Um, and notably that's true all across American history and it has particular moments in time in which that's uh, particularly true. Um, and they, uh, I think, tell us interesting uh, things about um, how the court has exercised its power, how it's built its power over time, um, and how it's contributed um, uh, to the process of limiting uh, the power of Congress, but also building uh, the American state uh, more generally. And building the American state part uh, is particularly significant when we think about the blue line. So the blue line uh, also comes from the data set and it's the first effort to uh, really try to come up with a comprehensive inventory of cases in which the court upheld um, acts of Congress against constitutional uh, challenge. Um, this is not something that Congress was particularly interested in when it asked uh, Corwin to create his list in the first place. Um, and uh, so such a list had not really been developed or maintained. Um, as to when did uh, the court uphold um, acts of Congress against um, a constitutional uh, challenge. I think it also turns out conceptually it's a little difficult um, to actually nail down uh, when that actually has occurred. Um, and so there's certainly some uh, points of potential contention uh, about how uh, this list is constructed. Um, but I think it's useful and does highlight a lot of what the court's been doing over uh, time. And as you can see from uh, this figure, um, most of what the court does when it reviews acts of Congress is uphold. Um, uh, congressional acts it is part of how the court has contributed across time uh, to building up congressional power um, is by um, insisting um, that Congress actually has the power um, to do things. Um, and even in some of its periods when we think of the court as being most activist and most restrictive um, about Congress, um, which often overlaps as well with times in which Congress has been quite aggressive um, about building up uh, the American state and building up its own power, um, it's still the case that the court um, tends to be quite accommodating um, uh, to uh, those exercises of congressional power and encouraging of Congress um, to do what it wants to do in order to advance uh, the policy it's trying to advance. And so as you can see here, for example, lots of challenges that arise um, to the court, uh, to Congress as it's building up uh, federal power over the course of the early 20th century. Um, for example, this is a period of a quite conservative court that in fact um, is striking down more laws uh, than it historically had been. Um, uh, but at the same time, it's upholding a massive number um, of laws and uh, important things that Congress um, is doing over time and, and telling Congress that it has uh, plenty of constitutional authority uh, to continue to build up uh, the kind of state that Congress, in fact, uh, wound up um, uh, building up. Um, I'll say a little bit more about um, uh, some of uh, what uh, I think is revealed in, in these um, uh, broad patterns of what the court is up to. There are interesting things about 
uh, particular periods and particular substantive themes that the court is developing over time, which I won't really uh, say anything about um, here. You got to buy the book and read it uh, in order to see those. Um, but um, uh, one thing to note is sort of how significant are those statutes that um, the court is invalidating over um, uh, time. Uh, the gray um, area are, is the um, uh, least important um, statutes. Um, the orange are uh, important statutes, and this comes from um, a book uh, done by a Congressional Research Serv uh, 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 Service scholar who um, was interested in uh, landmark statutes Congress had passed across uh, American history. Um, he's interested in a very different project, not particularly concerned about just review, um, but it was very helpful uh, for my purposes um, that you had somebody who'd gone through each Congress and said, well, what was the important stuff that Congress uh, did? Um, and then try to think about, well, how often did the court actually review that stuff um, as opposed to um, other things? Um, it turns out, um, as that um, orange um, and blue area suggest, um, that the court often is reviewing um, quite important statutes um, that um, Congress um, had passed. These are a relatively small number of actual statutes um, that Congress passes each time, sort of makes this list um, of landmark um, statutes, but they disproportionately occupy the court's attention um, in terms of constitutional challenges that get raised um, uh, to those statutes. Um, and often uh, the statutes that get our provisions of statutes that wind up getting uh, struck down. Um, it's also worth noting though, this blue area um, are, uh, reflects um, uh, those parts of the statutes that actually made it into uh, the little abstract of what the important thing Congress did um, uh, in that study of landmark statutes. And so while it's a lot of important statutes, um, it's often not the very important features of those statutes. And so um, these are often big and complicated statutes um, that Congress is creating, and you often see the court uh, nibbling around the margins um, of what uh, Congress had done. And so even if um, uh, what Congress had done was, was a fairly important thing, um, uh, the court um, uh, relatively rarely um, is focused on the central components of those statutes. The big picture of those statutes itself is much more focused um, on some uh, detail uh, somewhere uh, in the statute. Um, the project also tries to distinguish between instances in which the court um, strikes down the statute um, as a whole, or at least the statutory provision as a whole. So the court's not simply reviewing entire statutes, it's reviewing particular clauses and provisions um, of statutes over time. Oftentimes it's leaving most of the statute in place, um, even when it's striking down a little section um, of the statute. Um, but it's sometimes it's not even doing that. It's not just um, striking down little sections of the statute, but sometimes merely uh, enforcing uh, constitutional limits on that section of the statute. So it says the statute has to be interpreted uh, more narrowly than language might suggest because otherwise it's going to run into uh, constitutional problems. We have to have carve outs um, uh, to the language of the statute in order to make exceptions to account for um, uh, constitutional commitments in various ways uh, while still leaving um, some key features of that statutory provision in place that can be used uh, for other constitutionally um, acceptable um, purposes over time. And so there's a more modest use of judicial review um, that the court um, can engage in, uh, even when it's um, enforcing constitutional limits um, against Congress. And that orange area here uh, reflects those instances uh, where the court is not simply um, striking down um, the statute um, or statutory provision as a whole, but instead is trying to cabin um, the scope of that um, statute. And as you can see, that's often what the court um, is doing uh, when it's reviewing statutes. It's not simply trying to strike something from the books, but instead um, is simply saying um, you can't go too far uh, with how you read this uh, sometimes quite broad language that Congress uh, writes into uh, these statutes. Things have to be understood a little more narrowly than that. Um, this highlights um, uh, the partisan relationship between the court that's doing the reviewing of a statute and the Congress that passed the statute um, in the first place. Um, Dahl was particularly um, interested um, in this element. To what degree is what you see uh, Republican courts, for example, striking down Democratic uh, statutes um, in general. And certainly we see a fair amount of that kind of thing occurring over time. That's what's reflected in the blue areas um, are cases where uh, the court uh, and the majority of the court um, and the majority of the Congress that passes the statute um, are of different parties. 
Um, but it's often quite true as well, which is something that Mark uh, highlighted in his work, um, that the court, when it's invalidating things, is not simply going after the other party's um, statutes, but sometimes it's going after its own partisan allies um, and their statutes and um, striking down or narrowing uh, what it is their own partisan allies have done um, in various ways. This orange um, part are spaces uh, where the court and the Congress um, are both of the same party, um, and yet nonetheless, um, the court is finding uh, problems, uh, constitutional problems uh, with uh, the statutes that uh, Congress um, has passed and trying to impose some uh, limitations um, on how to think about um, the scope of those uh, statutes in time. Um, in some ways, this does not be uh, terribly surprising, except the doll um, suggested it should never happen. Um, so it's sort of surprising in that regard. Um, but also it should not be terribly surprising in the sense that um, uh, Congress and the court are often um, of the same party. And so if uh, the court is routinely reviewing the constitutionality of statutes, it's pretty often going to be hearing challenges to statutes um, uh, passed by co-partisans um, in Congress and there are periods in American history uh, where uh, we would expect um, uh, Congress and the court to be um, unified under a single partisan label uh, much of the time, uh, unlike the late 20th century here, where you get this wave of blue, where you get uh, divided government in that sense uh, much more often. But even in these periods where the court and the Congress are of the same party, it's often the case still um, that the court winds up enforcing some constitutional limitations, emphasizing this element that Mark highlighted and that Rogers highlighted in his political jurisprudence book, um, that the court is a kind of political institution, um, but, but unlike like Dahl, we shouldn't think of it as simply a crude political institution. It's not just um, a partisan policymaking institution that's going to move in lockstep um, uh, with um, uh, elected uh, politicians of the same party. Um, instead, the court is going to move to the beat of its own drummer. Um, it's going to have relationships and share some ideas and values and commitments um, with other um, uh, co-partisans and other political branches. Uh, but it's also going to have some differences, and those differences are sometimes going to get reflected um, in its willingness to strike down um, uh, even what its co-partisans uh, um, are doing. Um, and so finally, let me just briefly uh, note um, that um, uh, one thing the doll was particularly concerned with is how old are the statutes um, they're getting um, struck down. Um, uh, here I used actually a longer period of time than he did in, in making the divisions. So I note um, statutes they're struck down uh, within nine years of adoptions and those are struck down um, after nine years of adoption. Um, nine years is the median as to how long it took uh, for a statutory provision to get reviewed by the court and get um, invalidated and restricted in, in some way. Um, and nine years also seems like a particularly generous way um, of thinking about what's a relatively contemporaneous statute um, uh, that the court is evaluating um, that might still be politically salient uh, in its own uh, particular um, environment. So we might think that areas in orange are the areas in blue, that is those being cited within nine years are particularly politically touchy um, uh, from that perspective because they're relatively recent statutes that maybe Congress still cares about. <clears throat> Part of what's notable about what the court um, has been up to though across its history um, is it's often uh, reviewing and striking down uh, much older statutes than that. Um, it's frequently going back to statutes um, that are sometimes decades old um, and reviewing uh, the applications um, of those uh, revision, uh, provisions um, and uh, limiting their effect or striking them um, out um, entirely. Um, uh, these things are um, potentially things in the Congress, the current Congress is not particularly um, highly invested in, uh, doesn't necessarily have the same political stakes certainly doesn't have the same uh, political support behind it um, as when Congress was drafting that statute um, in the first place. Um, and so the court is um, um, often not butting heads um, uh, directly uh, with a contemporaneous uh, Congress across the street, um, but instead is going back and editing the work um, of a long dead Congress um, uh, from the uh, sometimes quite distant um, uh, past. Um, and so if you add all that together, which is to think about the uh, blue um, here being relatively recent statutes, uh, relatively important provisions of important statutes um, in cases in which 
um, uh, court and Congress are different parties. And so you might think that there's particular hostility um, ideologically and politically uh, between uh, those two bodies, um, as opposed to everything else um, that the court is invalidating. You'll see that those kinds of instances that what we might think of as the most classic um, instances of judicial reviews, the things that raise the counter majoritarian difficulty uh, most starkly um, uh, when the court is going after contemporaneous important statutes passed by the other party, um, that's actually quite rare. Um, the court is rarely uh, doing that, hardly ever, um, in fact, um, is doing that. Um, relative to its overall caseload, it's hardly ever doing that. But even relative to the set of cases uh, on which the court is limiting uh, congressional power, um, that's not generally uh, what it's up to. Um, it's generally uh, doing something that is politically weaker, uh, politically more modest, um, politically more limited. Uh, than, than that. And so the exercise of the power of judicial review, at least relative to Congress, um, laying aside um, questions of uh, the states um, and the like, which I think raises a different but uh, important um, set of questions as well as how the court relates to um, states, but at least relative to uh, Congress. Um, we don't see the court very often uh, wanting to run headlong into battles um, uh, with um, uh, currently powerful uh, political majorities um, in Congress. The court has been um, uh, more modest than that uh, in the kinds of activities it's engaged in, it's been more cautious um, than that and how it relates um, to the other branches um, of government uh, more, more generally. Um, so as I said in the beginning, this is not a road I ever expected to go down to spend this much time thinking about um, court and constitutional um, decisions. Uh, wasn't something I was initially interested in when I got into this business um, in the first place. Um, but but um, uh, Rogers and Mark um, uh, were among those um, who helped convince me that this is actually uh, something interesting. Um, and that there's important political questions there that we ought to be exploring. There's important connections uh, between what the court's up to and the the uh, intellectual ideas that are circulating more generally uh, within the political system, as well as the politics um, of the political system uh, more, more generally. Um, and so I blame them um, that I've gone down this uh, boring path um, of thinking about um, courts uh, too much. Um, and um, eventually I'll get out of my system and can go back to doing what I was more interested in uh, doing and thinking about uh, American political thoughts and, and uh, bigger ideas. Thanks. Thanks to the three panelists for their remarks. Um, now we have some time for a broader discussion. Uh, if there's anyone in the audience who wants to make a comment or ask a question to any of our speakers, just raise your hand and I will hopefully find you and um, we'll turn off your mute. Um, anyone wanna jump in? Well, while you're preparing your questions and comments, um, let me uh, raise an issue. Um, it strikes me that part of the background conditions of this panel is the potential anxiety about a court intervening in a democracy uh, over and against the, the will of the people. Um, but constitutionalism doesn't just mean the a uh, role of courts to have authority. It also means, especially in the American experiment, the role of the people to change the constitution. And yet one of the features of our time has been the lack of that happening. In the last, um, uh, since, since 1971, I believe, there's been only two constitutional amendments, one on the voting age in 72, and then in the early 90s, one on congressional pay. So not the most transformative issues, uh, to what degree is that a problem for a constitutional republic? Why has it happened? And thinking of Julie's point about how elites need to play some role in maintaining constitutional norms, is that part of what elites need to do is to occasionally uh, uh, make sure that the, that the constitutional amendment process uh, is functional? Uh, that would be a, a question that I would um, raise to anyone who wants to, to um, speak to it from the panel as we hear from other uh, audience members who can just raise their hands. Well, in one sense, relate to Rogers, there's been no constitutional amendment changing liberalism, though Rogers has documented how liberalism 
has dramatically changed in 230 years. So in fact, the Constitution of the United States, the text is very similar, but the Constitution, the courts, the presidency, the Congress parties are very different institutions than they were 50, 70 years ago. Now, in fact, you could argue that really, I'm not, there was a Sandy Levinson kind of question, and I'm not a Levinsonian, but you could argue the main problem with the United States now is neither the Constitution nor the polity, but a mismatch between them that perhaps this constitution doesn't work well with these kinds of institutions, but then you get a problem. In some sense, the problem is if we could solve the problem, there would be a problem. That is to say, if we had political institutions that worked well with this text, when there were flaws, the political institutions would be able to fix them either informally or, in, or formally. The problem is we have the sort of political institutions that don't work well with this text and aren't the sort of political institutions that can change the text. I, I was hoping that uh, Mark would kind of channel Sandy Levinson here a bit. Uh, the one thing I would add is that if we look at constitutional history, amendments tend to come in clusters. Uh, we tend to enter political space where we are more amenable to thinking about constitutional change and trying to put into place fixes that will reflect a, a better or mo more appropriate understanding of how our constitution should structure and facilitate politics. Um, we have not been in that space for a while. One might argue that with the current level of political division and this increasing sense of political crisis, we might be poised once again to enter that space. But of course, the way that the amendment process is structured makes it quite difficult because of the need for super majorities. So if I can channel full Sandy Levinson, um, you could look at this process as showing how difficult it is for the Constitution as it is structured, even in the ways that it has changed over time to accommodate the kinds of political problems that we're grappling with. Yeah, there's been an unfortunate decline in um, our ability and willingness to uh, rewrite uh, constitutional text. Some of that's clearly a feature of the constitutional text itself and the difficulty of amending, um, partially as a feature of our politics, as Mark highlights, um, uh, to get the kind of agreement that would be necessary uh, in order to modify um, uh, the constitutional text. Um, you know, we've done a remarkable job across American history to learn how to um, uh, live with and adjust um, our constitutional commitments uh, given a relatively persistent um, uh, constitutional text um, as a basic uh, foundation stone. Um, but there are limits as to what you can accomplish that way. Um, and it um, uh, would be, I think, desirable if we could more easily and more often um, uh, make some amendments. I should also um, note, I'm in the middle of reading uh, Robinson Woodward Burns's a uh, great uh, new book on uh, state constitutionalism and constitutional amendment uh, processes um, in general, which um, uh, is, is interesting. I recommend it to you and also um, uh, sort of highlights that uh, we've you know, encountered this kind of challenge at the state level as well. Um, there's a lot more constitutional amendments that occur at the state level for various um, uh, reasons. Um, one thing that's striking though at the state level is we've moved away from the convention format um, as a way of uh, rewriting and changing um, constitutions in ways that once was very important um, to our process of constitutional drafting and has now become uh, much less important as a vehicle 
uh, from rethinking uh, constitutions uh, from the ground up, uh, for better or for worse, um, but in part because it turns out it's really hard um, uh, to draft a whole new uh, constitution. So um, we're sort of stuck in this sort of piecemeal adjustment mode, um, which is sometimes inadequate and hard to do itself. Um, um, but it's a, it's a real challenge to think about how do you draft new constitutional text that serves you well and will serve uh, the future well um, as well. Thank you very much. We'll now go to Jack Nagel. So Jack, uh, unmute yourself once we unmute you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I have a question for Keith, and that is uh, how much uh, might Congress have been influenced uh, by the court, not by having uh, laws actually struck down, but by uh, inhibiting Congress's legislation by, because of the anticipation of what the court might do, what a court might accept or not accept? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a hard question, I think, to get as to how much um, uh, what you see or legislatures anticipating um, uh, what courts are doing. Um, it's part of what um, people press me about with this project and related projects uh, from early early on, um, in part because those damn game theorists uh, tend to really want to think about anticipated effects uh, until they really want to talk about it. And, and you know, but it's hard, it's hard to think about and identify uh, how much of that's actually occurring uh, in practice. Um, I tried to get that uh, at that a little bit um, in the book and try and think about what Congress is up to. I think I I do tend to think that in, in the case of Congress, at least, it probably does not have dramatic effects um, over time. I don't think Congress is that deterred um, by what the court's up to or um, is that um, uh, feels that constrained by what the court is up to and, and significantly limiting uh, what its options are um, in uh, engaging in new legislation. Um, um, but, you know, it's, it's hard to know for sure. Um, uh, there are times when there's discussions and seemingly political will in Congress that seems um, to bump up against uh, some of those constitutional limits as the court uh, might understand them. But you, um, you know, have two kinds of problems. You have sort of the non-event problem, right, of, of Congress not actually passing those statutes. And so you don't get to observe um, the effort um, uh, to challenge the court um, on those issues. Um, and you have the problem of disentangling to what degree is Congress just not have the will um, to adopt um, things that the court um, also thinks is unconstitutional. Certainly you see lots of pushback in Congress itself and arguing not just the court will strike something down, but in fact, we shouldn't be doing that um, because that's uh, constitutionally inappropriate. Um, you saw that more earlier in America's history than you tend to see it now. Um, but, but I think there's um, a lot of constitutional talk that occurs um, in Congress and has occurred in Congress across American history that's not just focused on can we get away with it um, and will the court reject it, um, but is also concerned with uh, what we understand our own constitutional responsibilities to be and therefore what should we refrain from doing. Um, again, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, or um, you're also welcome to use the chat to share a more uh, personal reflection if the spirit moves you. Um, in the meantime, you know, Mark, you began by emphasizing the importance of ideas that, that Rogers acknowledged that and that had its own trajectory. Um, thinking of our current moment in the context of constitutionalism, I'd be curious to any of the panelists what they see as new ideas on the horizon, either in the form of new jurisprudential doctrines uh, or in the form of um, alternate constitutional uh, structures that the US might be um, able to learn from, from abroad. Uh, if so, the first part of that question would be, you know, if, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, if affirmative action is um, overturned or other uh, policies connected to the right succeed jurisprudentially, is that gonna be on the basis of some new jurisprudential set of doctrines or is it just gonna be a new outcome from the usual doctrines? And then the second prong of that question again would be to think of new ideas from a more global perspective. When you look as scholars of constitutionalism elsewhere in the world, do you find um, new institutions of constitutionalism or new doctrines of jurisprudence that may be worthwhile for those in America to consider um, in a learning mode. 
Uh, and after that, we'll go to a question. So if anyone wants to take a brief stab at that. Um, I'll suggest, yeah. it's no and yes. No with respect to the present core. So I rather suspect for most people in the room, if I had given the following final exam, which I actually did give a version of, it says Samuel Alito is writing an opinion overruling Roe, but has hand cramps. Uh, would you write the opinion for him? Most of us could do it and probably do a better Alito opinion. So Roe, if Roe will be overruled on old ideas, affirmative action will be overruled on old ideas. But when I talk with my students, so for example, on simple things, my liberal students are no longer narrow as narrow Second Amendments. They seem to be accepting Heller. Um, they're not, my liberal students are not ACLU on free speech. Um, there, there was, I teach a New Deal consensus, which I think structured politics, particularly on the left, but also in the center for about 70 years. I think that's breaking down. And I think people with more hair and with less gray hair than us are reorganizing the constitutional world, perhaps just like in a great many countries where positive rights are common, international law is explicitly considered part of the national law. Just, it used to be the United States was the model of a constitution. Um, now it's, this is what we don't want to do. Just a very minor corollary. I don't know if the direction that free exercise jurisprudence seems to be going could be considered new or if it could simply be considered as a, a very, very robust and aggressive development of something old, but that it is going to be influential um, and significant, I, I have no doubt. I'll say I'm a little skeptical that about how much influence uh, the international realm is likely to have on American jurisprudence as such. Um, the United States has tended to focus on its own um, uh, sets of ideas, although they may uh, be ideas that have connections uh, to things that are going on abroad, but I doubt we'll be importing uh, very directly uh, from things going abroad. And of course, I think there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty as to um, uh, what's going to influence the court um, in coming years, in part because there's tremendous uncertainty in our current environment about uh, which political party will eventually gain dominance um, in the political system and as a consequence um, have significant influence over the court um, in, in coming years. I think it's still not um, unlikely um, that um, eventually the Democratic Party um, solidifies um, a majority that is able uh, to take control of the court and uh, redirect um, the direction of constitutional jurisprudence. Um, even to the extent the court remains a Republican leaning court, I think it's very unclear as to what um, uh, direction that might um, uh, take. The court now, I think, is still uh, being deeply influenced by sets of ideas that have been developed over the last several years. The Roe opinion itself, I think, reflects uh, Alito's draft at least, uh, reflects the conservative defensive crouch of Glucksburg. Um, I think that that's uh, entirely possible, will be less likely to be true um, in coming years um, if you continue to see conservatives being uh, dominant, um, including I think real illiberal strands um, of conservatism that are gaining some real headway, um, both in the conservative legal movement um, and in broader politics uh, more generally. Um, they don't have much effect on the court um, uh, now now, um, but if they continue uh, to gain traction, you can imagine them having uh, effect on the court uh, down the road. Thank you. Let's go now to a question from a phone number, 215-776-2155. Um, <laughs> um, we'll try to unmute you and look forward to hopefully hearing you. What? Hi, Jeff. It, it's Nancy Hirschman. I'm sorry. I've been. Can you hear me? I feel like we're on a radio show. Yes, Nancy. Hi. Welcome. Hello. 
Um, was it something you said? Hello? Yes, hi, Nancy, Hello? you're on the air. Oh, hi, yay, yay. Um, so, uh, Mark, this is a question for you, but also partly for Rogers. Um, I love the term Neodalian. Are we ever gonna be talking about Neosmithians and what would that look like? One of the things Rogers taught us that I have taken to heart, so he had a band, he's abandoned, predict the past and not the future. I still think, contrary to at least one major book, the North won the Civil War, and I'm willing to go out a limb on that. Um, I think, you know, whether we talk about Neo-Smithians, as I said, probably not in public law in large part, because Rogers really now is a scholar of political development, a scholar of race, scholar of American politics. What I think is important and what this conference is really about is it, and Julie made this point extremely well, think of the wide variety of topics of the exceptional scholars that are gonna follow us, all of whom are influenced by Rogers, and ask yourself, you know, in another retirement for very distinguished people, would the scope of topics, the scope of scholars whose work Rogers made possible be nearly as broad? Yeah, I don't know if there'll be Neo-Smithians as such. I will just say, and, and I should say as well, I taught some of this stuff in my graduate seminar this semester and my students objected to calling it Neo-Dollian as well. So they thought doll should just be written out of this. So, you know, may, maybe that won't uh, stick around much uh, in the future. But I'll just say uh, in my own work uh, in particular that uh, I, I know it would not take the form that take, it takes now, um, if not for Roger's uh, influence and example um, and, and mentoring. Um, and it's quite possible I wouldn't have even uh, stayed in political science um, if not uh, for that. I can't, I can't blame him for going to political science in the first place because I didn't know what I was getting into uh, when I went to grad school. Uh, but I can easily imagine if, if Yale had looked a little bit different uh, when I was there, I wouldn't have stuck it out uh, and would have gone to do something else. And so uh, uh, Rogers uh, uh, bears much responsibility for all the dreadful things I've done uh, in the discipline uh, for now and, and uh, all the dreadful things I'm going to do in the future. <laughs> well, we're almost at time. Uh, Julie, would you just like some final reflections on the Neo-Smithian uh, suggestion? And anyone else, any final reflections before we take a break to our 11 o'clock panel? Sure, all I would add is that in some ways, I think it is more of a contribution to open space for broader consideration of these vital issues and concerns than it is necessarily to found a particular influential way of looking at these questions. So if the contribution is opening that space, I think it is enormously worthwhile and will benefit our generation of scholars and many, many future generations of scholars. Thank you. Um, well said and uh, appreciate all of your participation in our opening panel. We're gonna take a break now and uh, reconvene at 11 a.m. on the same Zoom link uh, when we'll be discussing the topic of race uh, and inequality. So look forward to seeing many of you then. I just wanna thank uh, Keith, Julie, and Mark for their outstanding contribution and for starting things off at the conference so well. We're really grateful for you being here and look forward to seeing many of you throughout the day. So um, take care and to be continued at 11 a.m. <laughs>